Thank you, Dr. Hooker. I, uh, I appreciate your early thoughts about the power of story. Uh, that's something that I've tried to live into in my life. Um, and I think I absorbed that as a young man, as a high schooler, certainly in college, um, thinking about a career in journalism. Uh, and at the time, the way I thought about that was God is doing something in this world, and God needs my help. I grew up in the Christian right, and it was all about power. How, how do I get power so that I can give God my power and, and God can use me to do whatever it is that God is trying to do? Now, the way I thought about that as, as a young man, as a teenager, was and I, I'm going to, th this is anachronistic now, so I'm looking back on that, but how do I keep gays and lesbians in their place? How do I keep them in the closet? How do I keep them from getting too much power, right? Um, how do I protect unborn babies? I don't really know anything about their mothers or the circumstances of their lives, but God needs me to protect those those fetuses, right? Abortion, homosexuality, that's how I thought about God using me and my power. Uh, then I got out into the world, graduated from Christian college, got into the newsroom, and uh, found myself sur surrounded by and having to deal with people who didn't see the world the way I did all, all the time, from the editor sitting right next to me, to all the different kinds of people I had to interview and interact with. Uh, I had an experience where this young father called up the newsroom. The, f the, f the call was routed to me. I answered his call, and he went on to tell me this story about how he'd gone to the local supermarket. He was trying to buy some diapers, and some milk. He had two little young, young children, one baby. He needed to buy some infant formula. He dug something like three, I think this is the exact number, $3.73 out of the couch, out of his car cushions, a big pile of coins. And he went to buy the things that he needed for his family. And the cashier said, no, I'm not going to deal with all that change. You know, we, he had actually rolled it up in the little paper rolls. And, uh, and so he went to the manager and said, how, how can this be? I, how can you not take U.S. currency for the things that I need? And they started to tell a story about, uh, this was just months after 9-11. Well, I, we're afraid of anthrax. In the, in the coin rolls, we're afraid of anthrax. Uh, so I listened to this gentleman's story. I told the story, wrote it in the newspaper, when it, uh, first interviewed the people at the supermarket. Can you explain to me how this happens? Uh, and the supermarket chain acts. This guy is, the manager's moved to, for some retraining, and uh, I felt like I helped this, 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 this young man, this young father, get some dignity back. Um, I felt that power, the power of story, in, an, in, a, in a new way, um, that maybe story could change people's lives and make their lives better. Um, and so my shall we say, my, my sense of morality, my sense of politics began to change by, by encountering these different kinds of stories. But what didn't change is the fact that I was a white male thinking about my power and how could I use my power in order to help other people. 
And so there was still lots of ways that my sense of uh, my own story had to, had to be changed, had to be affected by other people's stories. Uh, I moved to North Carolina, and uh, I had grown up in New Hampshire, and uh, New Hampshire is 96, 97% white. Um, and I had a couple of uh, circumstances early on where I realized that I had stepped into racial conflict in a way that I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't know that I, I was on a side. I thought I was on everybody's side. And, and then I realized that I was going to be put in a certain category. There were, there were all sorts of expectations. I'll, I'll give you an example. I'm, I'm being kind of vague. But, so I was walking along a, um, there's a walking trail down in Chapel Hill, uh, Chapel Hill of Carborough. I was living down there at the time. Uh, walking along with uh, my wife and some friends, and um, walked by this this gentleman. He was uh, maybe around 50, and we're in conversation. I just kind of nod gently at him to try to, you know, say hello, which to me was, uh, I was going out of my way as a New Englander to be nice to a stranger in the street. Because uh, we, we try not to make eye contact up there. We don't really greet each other in the street. Um, and as we walked by, I heard this guy say, you bunch of rednecks. And, and, and then, you know, he got maybe 20 feet away. I turned around and I said, hey, what's up, man? You know, I'm trying to understand how I'm, I, I became a redneck in that moment. And he said, you, you can't even say hello to a person? See, I thought I, thought I was saying hello in the way that I knew how without being creepy about it. But it wasn't what he expected. Um, and so, you know, I could stomp my feet and say, this is so unjust, you know, I'm I, I, here, I, I'm, I'm one of the good guys, you know, I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm one of the guys who loves everybody. And, uh, and, and that wasn't his story. And I think, what I have found, I, um, I worked for a time at a church as a music minister where we were committed to trying to create a multiracial um, a music ministry, which um, is a can of worms. It's a, it's a really, really difficult thing to do. Um, and what I came to realize in these experiences is, is that being a white male it's in my interest that we ignore meta narrative. We ignore myth. We ignore those frames and pretend that they are the truth. They are the way. And when I have to encounter a man like this on the street and and my limits, my failures, my, my power and my privilege are shown to me, then I have to change my story. My story is not enough anymore. When I try to make music in new ways, and what I, I try to explain what I'm doing, why why I'm, I'm, uh, why I'm rushing that beat, why I'm behind that beat, where the art is and how I make the art. And someone's looking at me like, I don't understand what you're talking about. I don't know why you would sing it that way. I don't know why you would play it that way. I have to change my story. And it's painful. I, I don't want to change my story. I, 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 I've... I've won my story. I've won my story by a lot of hard work and a lot of pain. And I encounter difference, and now my story is not good enough anymore. And 
I think um, a lot of our churches ta- are taking that for granted. Our society is taking that for granted. And I think um, particularly uh, I found white Christians who maybe, maybe lived through the civil rights movement or in its immediate aftermath and believed that simply wanting reconciliation was going to be enough to enact reconciliation and realizing that it's not been enough and our churches are still segregated and our society is still segregated. Um, We are hard pressed to confess that we have to change our stories, that it, it's, it's not enough to say we all just need to get along, but we have to suffer, we have to suffer pain, you know, and I, I have, I, I have certainly other white male friends, for example, who uh, struggle with the realities of academia, say, that they're not really wanted, you know, they're, they, those jobs, um, the people hiring might be more interested in hiring women, hiring minorities, trying to make right some of the un- injustice that we've lived with, our systems have lived with, and they're saying, but, you know, I'm just trying to get a job. I'm just trying to do the work that I want to do. And we, we have to, um, I think, feel that pain and be willing to tell new stories, let our stories be affected by, uh, by other people's stories. Do, you all, do, do any of you know um, John Steen? John Steen was a student here um, a couple years ago. I had the, the good fortune to work with John um, at Durham Presbyterian Church, and uh, um, he's now working with, with um, Dr. Barber at the NAACP. And I'll, I'll never forget um, something John said in a sermon, a, a question he asked, really, uh, and it is, uh, it was, could it be that our, our human stories, the stories that we've lived, can become God's word to us? And it, it seems to me that It's been in, in, the, in the interest of people in power to, to hold that down. If, if, you can, if you can take a more biblicist approach and you can control how the text is interpreted, then you can keep, keep things the way they are, keep the kind of order that you've experienced and not have to incorporate those human those stories of human life and how that text has been experienced uh, and i uh, dr hooker was talking about the way that um heresy has been dealt with and how there's been a dominant story um that has won at different junctures in the history of the church. And I think now uh, we're working to try to recover some of those marginal, the stories that were made marginal, both in history and today. And if, if, John's, if John's question is as important as I think it is, then that lived experience, that human life, those human stories, if they are the voice of God, then 
we have to continue to let others' stories reshape our own stories, no, no matter how hard and no matter how painful it might be. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.